the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, Mother Church honors one of these great saints, St. Therese of the Child Jesus. She is a model poured out to us, really to live the simplicity of the Gospels. And I think Our Lady of Fatima, when she appeared to the children of Fatima in 1917, she just con reconfirmed that spirit of generosity, simplicity, self-sacrifice for the love of souls, to save souls from hell that St. Teresa the Child Jesus had. And St. Pius X held her up as the model and patroness of missions. Here's what the treasure of the Roman breviary says about St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. Teresa of the Child Jesus was born in Alençon in France. Her parents were estimable people, well known for their piety and their love of God. From her earliest childhood, endowed by a special grace of the Holy Ghost, she yearned to enter the religious life. Uh, open brackets, of course she had some good example from her own sisters. Four of her, four of her sisters would enter the Carmel. Three had already entered before her. So what a good example from her big sisters. And then we continue. She promised God with the utmost sincerity that she would deny him nothing that he asked of her. She kept this promise faithfully to the end of her life, although she had to suffer a great deal to keep it. Her mother died when little Teresa was but five years old. From then on, the child committed herself to the providence of God under the vigilant care of a most tender father and her elder sisters. Under their teaching, little Teresa raced as happily strong as a young giant running along the way of perfection. So we know in her autobiography how she mentions her father would read from Dom Garanger, the liturgical year, which is a, a real treasure. And it is, that is the real spirit of the liturgical renewal, if you want to put it that way. All these modernists thought that the liturgical renewal had to involve lay participation and turn the altar around to face the people and all this bizarre ceremony, which has nothing to do with the Catholic faith. That's why the new mass is illegitimate. It is not a Catholic rite. It has Catholic elements, but it's not a legitimately promulgated rite of the Catholic Church. That's why we shouldn't even be arguing, does the new mass give grace or not? Does the new mass nourish the faith? No, because it's not even a Catholic rite from the first place. And Archbishop Lefebvre, he argued and stood firmly against that one word, legitimately promulgated. It is, is it, the new mass is a bastard mass, meaning it's illegitimately promulgated. And Pope Paul VI, he did not follow the normal rules of a pope. He broke all the rules, and he issued his own private missile. And this missile would lead to the destruction of the faith throughout the whole world. So, Dom Garanger, he is the real, the right intention that Pius X wanted to deepen our love and knowledge of the sacred liturgy, to know the history, to know all the saints, all that they've contributed to the hymns, to the parts of the, of the divine office. So, little Therese, she grew up around the fireplace, with her dad reading from this treasure of a book, and it deeply impressed her soul. And look at the fruits, she became a saint. So Dom Garanger, this Benedictine great monk and abbot, he had a true influence on little Teresa of the Child Jesus. So I was certainly, it's a model to our, all fathers of families. Shut off the computer games, gather the family around, and read Dom Garanger. It's a treasure, and it will do more good for the children's souls 
than a thousand hours of useless video games. Can you imagine if St. Teresa's father let them play video games? We wouldn't have had St. Teresa. We wouldn't have had her sisters, who are, some of them are already venerables and blesseds. So we have to imitate these great saints and reject the spirit of the world. So I continue. Under their teachings, St. Therese, Teresa raced as, as happily strong as a giant running along the way of perfection. At the age of nine, she was sent to the school of Lisieux to the Benedictine nuns, where she made remarkable progress in her knowledge of divine things. In her 10th year, she was very ill for a long time of a serious and mysterious malady. From this, as she herself tells us, she was delivered only by the power of God himself through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary who appeared to her with a smiling face and to whom, under the title of Our Lady of Victories, she was constantly making novenas. So this statue is still in her house today that very statue with Our Lady smiling. Filled with angelic fervor, she prepared herself at this time with the utmost care to receive Christ in the sacred banquet of her first Holy Communion. After being refreshed for the first time with the Holy Eucharist, St. Teresa seemed to develop an in in insatiable hunger for the celestial food. Then, as if by inspiration, she asked Jesus to turn all her earthly con consolation into bitterness. After that, she burned with the most tender love for Christ the Lord and for his church. More than anything in the world, she wanted to enter the order of the discalced Carmelites. That means they, they don't wear shoes that cover the feet and socks. They wear sandals all year round. So it's a real penance, obviously, in winter where by self-denial and self-sacrifice, St. Teresa might assist priests and missionaries and the whole church, and so gain innumerable souls for Jesus Christ. Yes, so here in her autobiography, she says that, I want to be a priest. I would love to be a martyr. I would love to be one of the crusaders to go fight to defend the Holy Land and the Catholic people. She wanted to be all these great things, a doctor of the church, a confessor, because of her zeal and her love, but she, she obviously couldn't be any of these things. And she said, I know I can't, but I will make myself small and I will be the little flower that Christ will pick up and hold on his knee because, because being small, you have to be picked up. And so that was her spirit. And she said, I will be I will be love in the church. I will love God with all my heart and strength and offer everything to him, and by this means save many, many souls. And this is exactly what Our Lady of Fatima and the angel of Fatima taught the children of Fatima, that simple Catholic spirit to help the whole church. Because every thought, every word, every action we do or omission, it does affect the whole church. So when you throw a rock in the middle of a pond, the whole pond is affected by the ripples. So when you pray, when you make some sacrifice, when you offer the cross as God often sends us out of love for God, and say, as Our Lady of Fatima taught the children, O oh my Jesus, it is for the love of thee, for the conversion of sinners, for the Holy Father, and in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we affect the whole entire church. And this is the, the great spirit of St. Therese, and hence, she's called the patroness of missions, even though she wasn't a missionary, but her heart burned like a missionary, like St. Francis Xavier, St. Isaac Job, St. John de Brebeuf, and St. Patrick here in Ireland. He burned with that missionary spirit to convert these people. If only Ireland would listen to St. Patrick again. I continue. All this she promised God would do for her, even when apparently she lay at the point of death. Her extreme youth was an obstacle which hindered her entrance upon the religious life. Even this she overcame by her incredible courage of soul. 
So it's at this age, at age 15, she went with a family, her father and family and some friends on the train to Rome. And it's there she gathered dirt from the catacombs, dirt that was soaked in the blood of so many millions of martyrs. She went, saw the freshly, newly excavated tomb where St. Cecilia's body was found and corrupt. And she took dirt from there. And then they got to see Pope Leo XIII. They were told, don't say anything, kiss his feet, get his blessing and get out of there. And this is where her courage shines. Little Therese, she went up, kissed his feet. She looked him in the eye and she said, Holy Father, I want to enter Carmel. Can I have permission to enter the Carmelite convent at 15? Pope Leo XIII is probably a little surprised at the courage of this little girl, but he probably smiled, and, but he told her, if God wills it, my daughter, you will enter. And God did will it, she did enter. And maybe today, if she went, <laughs> if she went to Pope Francis, uh, I don't know, she might slap him in the face and correct him. She probably would, and she would say, stop destroying the church. Stop going against Catholic tradition. Listen to Archbishop Lefebvre, it was a grace for the church. He probably would. Then he would go to, then she would make a trip to uh, uh, Winona, or in, uh, Minas, uh, in Virginia, and go to the seminary and find Bishop Follet and slap him. Then she'd go to Broadstairs and slap Bishop Williamson for all he's saying about the new mass and compromise and no need for seminaries when he should have built already three seminaries and the Catholic resistance would be strong and there'd be monasteries and convents right now and priories and more priests. But he's done everything to cut it down and dissolve it and disperse it. And he will answer to that. And St. Teresa would have gone to broad stairs and slapped him <laughs> with all respect. And then she'd go find Bishop Tissier at Icon and remind him, stop being a little mouse and stand up for the faith. Like Archbishop Lefebvre, you wrote his book, follow his example. That's what she would say. And then she'd go find Bishop Galaretta and smack him also for telling everyone, well, Bishop Follet decided to go with modernist Rome. We, well, his exact words, well, um, it's in, it's in French, but something along the lines, well, that's the way it's going to go. We have to go along with it. So she would have done that. That's the kind of spirit she had, St. Therese, Saint, because, not because it was personal. She would respect these bishops and the Pope, but she loved the Catholic Church. That's why she loved our Lord. She loved the mission and the role of the Catholic Church, the spouse of Christ. That's why she would have been rough on the Pope and bishops. And I think from heaven, I think she agrees with me totally. And she would do it because, remember, they were told everyone was silent, all these adults. Everyone, don't talk to the Pope. He's got a long day, he's too busy. Kiss his foot and move on. But her heart was too big. And she had the Pope before him. She was kneeling before him, and, and she asked great things. So she asked to enter at age 15, and the Pope smiled, and, and sure enough, God gave her wish. And then we continue. Even this she overcame by her incredible courage of soul. She entered Carmel at Lisieux happily at the age of 15. There God fashioned the heart of little Teresa in a marvelous way, teaching her to ascend to him step by step, imitating the hidden life of the Virgin Mary. Like a well-watered garden, she bore flowers of every virtue, especially an abiding love of God and neighbor. So we see that in her autobiography. When they were doing laundry, the sister next to her splashed her with dirty water quite by accident. And St. Teresa, instead of taking her towel and rolling it up and smack, smacking the sister, like probably many of us would do, she just bore it patiently and didn't even show any frustration or agitation. She just offered it out of love for God. 
And then she writes about in the convent, during meditation, they do two hours of meditation, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening, before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And it used to drive her crazy that the sister behind her, uh, I've heard two things. One, it was the sister rattling her rosary beads against the pew, which drove her crazy. But I've also heard this, that it was an old nun behind her that would just grind her teeth, her false teeth in her mouth. She would just grind them in her mouth and it would drive her absolutely crazy during that hour. But whatever it was, it was annoying to it probably more than St. Teresa, but she just offered it out of love for God. And that's the example we have to follow and embrace. Sometimes there's situations at the job, at the workplace. Sometimes there's situations in the home that you just can't change. And you just accept the faults of the spouse, the faults, well, we have to correct the faults of our children, of course, but we can't change what they are. Their, their character is their character, and we want to bring out the best of their character. But sometimes characters are the way they are. And we have to sometimes accept these things, such as whatever it is in a family. So here she is in the family of the Carmel. And, and then there was an old nun that always was complaining. And no one really wanted to deal with her because she was so grouchy. So St. Teresa volunteered and said, I will take care of her. And so all the time, every time she took care of her, you're walking too fast. You're walking too slow. Ter Sister Teresa, stop pulling my arm. Let me sit down at my pace when she's going to the table. Stop pushing my chair too far. And she just complained and grouchy as ever. But without malice. But St. Teresa saw this as a great occasion of... It was like winning the lottery for heaven. And the saints, have to, they teach us how to see some of the situations that sometimes the most annoying, the most difficult, the most heavy crosses are actually winning the lottery for heaven. And she saw that. So we, we want to learn from St. Teresa to see with her eyes all these little annoyances that the world despises and wants to get out of and has painkillers for everything. We want to sometimes just bear these things out of love for God. As I said many times, there was uh, old Mr. Van der Putten, and he was dying. He came from Holland, and had a big family farm in Missouri. And uh, that great old man, I saw him, and he, and anointed, he brought extreme unction to him in Missouri many years ago, back in 93, when he died. But he had lumps of cancer all over him. And he would refuse the painkiller during the day. He would take it at night so he could sleep. But he would, he would refuse the painkiller during the day in order to offer it with Christ crucified, with the Immaculate Heart and the Sacred Heart of Jesus to save souls. So that's a very powerful example. And that's really what St. Therese did also when she was dying. We see her charity. She would sometimes be coughing at night, coughing up blood. She had tuberculosis. And that she wouldn't wake up the other sisters in the infirmary, infirmary the, the, the sick room. She would crawl on her hands and feet outside the, and go into the hallway and sleep there to let the other sisters not be woken by her coughing. So that's the kind of generous soul she was. So we finish here. That she might please the Most High God to greater degree when she read in sacred scriptures the warning, whoever is a little one, let him come to me. She determined to be a little one in spirit. As such, she consecrated herself forever with childlike confidence to God, her most loving father. Uh, again, um, as a young girl, she, she was, uh, France was still heavily influenced by the Jansenist spirituality which portrayed God as a revengeful God to just out to crush you. But she, at a retreat of given by one of the priests, she discovered the great mercy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. 
And this, through the Sacred Heart, she grew rapidly in perfection. And this is what our Lord promises. Those who love the Sacred Heart of Jesus, they will rise from lukewarmness to fervor, fervor to perfection. The little way of St. Therese, the way, she called it, of spiritual childhood, following the teachings of the Gospel, she taught to others, especially to the novices in the convent who were training in the pursuit of religious virtues. She undertook in obedience to her superiors. Overflowing with apostolic zeal, she pointed out to a world filled with pride and love of vanities, the simple way of the Gospels. Meanwhile, Jesus, her spouse, inflamed her with a desire to suffer both in soul and in body. Moreover, perceiving that the love of God was everywhere rejected, she became filled with grief, and two years before her death, offered herself as a victim of love to the merciful God. She writes, she was then wounded by a flame of fire from heaven, whereupon she became consumed by love, wrapped, as it were, in ecstasy. So, very similar to St. Teresa of Avila, who was also struck in the heart by a mystical arrow of love, and her heart burned out of love for God, physically. And when she died, they, when her body was exhumed, they found her heart incorrupt, and it still is incorrupt, and it has a hole in it from that arrow. And uh, during the great um, Catholic resistance in Spain to the communist invasions, the great General Franco himself went to the convent of St. Teresa and took the relics of her heart and other relics of her bones in safekeeping until the war was over. So he had a great love and devotion to St. Therese. Can you picture Joe Biden in America going to rescue the relics of the saints kept in the U.S.? He could care less. So, so maybe here in Ireland they'd have a little more respect. I don't know uh, if the politicians here, but that's pretty bad from what I hear. So she writes, she was then wounded by the flame of fire, repeating over and over again the fervent words, My God, I love thee. She died on passing on to her spouse on September 30th, 1897, at age 24. As she was dying, she promised that she would let fall upon earth a ceaseless shower of roses. This promise she has indeed fulfilled in heaven, and her shower of roses has continued to this very day. The Sovereign Pontiff, Pope Pius XI, added her name to the virgins, declared blessed, and two years later, at the time of the great jubilee, listed her among the saints. He also appointed and declared her patroness of all the missions. So it, it is described on the very day when Pope Pius XI was standing declaring her a saint, one of the roses that were way up on the pillars and the, the higher sections of St. Peter's Basilica broke off and the rose just fell gracefully and landed at the Pope's feet. So she was already showing, I'm going to send rainstorms of roses from heaven. And she still does. And I'm sure you here in Ireland know her and are grateful to her. And we all are. I think, I don't know anyone who doesn't love St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. So pull her mantle and tug her, her Carmelite scapular to help us from heaven. She does work miracles. Let me just close by quoting St. Leo the Great, talking about this gospel of today, St. Matthew chapter 18, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And here's what St. Leo the Great says, Do not become children in mind, but in malice. Be children, not in mind, in, but in malice. Be children in mind, mature. We are not to return to the games of childhood, nor to their imperfect beginnings. Rather, we are to carry on those things befitting maturity, the swift passing of anger, 
So this is where we have to imitate, to imitate children. And he lists it here. The swift passing of anger, the speedy restoration of peace, forgetful, forgetfulness of injuries like children, indifference to honors, love of the companionship of friends, natural evenness of temper. It is indeed a great blessing to know no evil, to bear no malice. To inflict injury for injury is the philosophy of this world. To render no man evil for evil is the childhood of Christian goodwill. So our Lord does say, unless we become like little children, we won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And of course, he doesn't mean childishness, like Pope Francis putting on the red nose in these horrible goofy liturgies that is not what our lord meant but he does mean that we become like children in malice that we bear no grudges we forgive easy we stay focused on what's most important the glory of god the salvation of souls in union with jesus crucified archbishop lefebvre he was a missionary on on his feet and he traveled everywhere throughout africa and everywhere he went, well, there was growth, schools, there was organization and structure. He had seminaries, he had orphanages, he had catechism uh, arrangements where the laymen would go and catechize the, Indian, the African tribes. He had hospitals, he had schools, he had uh, retreat homes for priests. There was structure and organization. How else can you build the church? You can't even have a basketball game or a hockey game without structure and organization. So when we hear this talk about no structure and organization, it is not from the spirit of the Catholic Church, that's for sure, at all. The church organizes, Christ organized 12 apostles and set one as monarch and chief, St. Peter. Peter, you are, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And we trust in those words, in this darkness of the church history. We turn to St. Therese, St. Therese of the Child Jesus. We turn to the heart of Mary to bring an end to this horrible darkness of this epic in church history and restore the light of Catholic tradition to Rome and to the whole Catholic world and to all the governments, the reign of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Maybe it will be through Russia being provoked, as is prophesied, and will march over Europe and bomb it. And America might suffer some bombs as well, because it's Wall Street that's provoking yet another revolution. They did in 1917, and they're doing it again. They are the enemies of Christ of the synagogue of Satan, and they don't stop. So God may punish the world through Russia. And it is prophesied through Our Lady of Fatima that Russia, when the Pope properly consecrates Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, as she asked, without the humanitarian language, that Russia will be the instrument to bring the world back to the reign of Christ the King. Isn't that interesting? It's the only country forbidding sodomy in its country, forbidding this, the rainbow parades, it's trying to squelch abortion, and that's the only country doing it. So let's pray to the Mother of God for the triumph of her Immaculate Heart through St. Teresa. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us in the course to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us in the course to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us in the course to thee. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons, and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.